Well, welcome to the Peter Friedman Suite at the Chateau Marmont. Thanks Thank for you. your time, Francis. Lovely, lovely place you have here. Yeah, me. man. Seriously, thanks for coming and spending the time with me. We've known each other a long time, but uh, this That's is the first right. time I've grilled you about your past and hopefully uh, your future and what you're doing now. So, yeah. where were you born? Uh, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, oh. home of the automobile. Okay. And uh, it's a wonderful place to be from and not at. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, there was always something about California when I was a kid. I don't know what, what the draw was, but I always had this idea that I was going to go and live in California at some point in my life. Mm. And it was just always, uh, you know, that beacon on the hill for me to come out to California. A beach boy. Something like that. Although I don't surf and I don't think I've been in the water much deeper than up to my knees. Right. So. <laughs> you don't surf? No, I don't surf. Okay. Nope. No, but you moved. You moved to so you moved to Redondo with your parents, or you? No, no. I came out with a with a band. There were six of us, All right. and uh, I came out here with three hundred dollars in my pocket, and we rented a, a studio in um, in Inglewood, right in the corner of Manchester and La Brea, downtown Inglewood, and uh, we it was the old Inglewood courthouse, and we practiced in the courtroom, and each one of us lived in the various rooms around there, where there was the the jury room and the judges' chambers and the court reporter. And I had the jury room, and right. the jury room was soundproof and padded. So when I went in there at night and closed the door, it was pitch black and absolutely quiet, nice. which was nice until I moved out. It took me about six months to get a good night's sleep with noise and light and sure. whatnot. So it was, it, was, it was pretty wild. Did you use the holding cell for a verb? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's where we put the rest of the band people, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> the groupies. Yeah. You know. But uh, we lived there for about a year, and then um, my band did what all bands do. We broke up. Mm. And some of the guys filtered back to Detroit, and uh, I was going to go back. I got offered a position doing live sound at University of Michigan. A friend of mine ran the Eclipse Jazz program there. Mm. But he said, in order to do it for a University of Michigan, you've got to have some formal training. So I said, okay, well, let me see what I can do. And I found this little place called Dick Grove Music Workshop in Hollywood. And they had a 10-week engineering course. And I don't know if you've ever done a 10-week course in anything. It's like, there's a tape machine, there's a board, here's a microphone, thank you very much. Mm. You know? But during the, that 10 weeks, I started going out with this lovely young lady who is now my wife of almost 30 years. Congratulations. Thank you. So when I was done, the guy who ran the program, Jack Hunt, who was a well-known mastering engineer, said to me, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I was thinking about going back to Michigan. And he said, no, you have a really good knack for this. You should, you should continue your education. And I said, love to. Where? Hmm. And he said, there's only one place, and that's Brian Inglesby's Soundmaster in North Hollywood. So my now mother-in-law loaned me the money to go to Soundmasters, I think she was putting a down payment on a husband, is what she nice. was doing. <laughs> got, to have, got to have something to make money. Got to have with, something, yeah. got to have something, you know. So I went through the Soundmaster program, and um, the focus of the program was signal flow and not how to use. Brian's philosophy was teach them how things work, not how to work things. Mm. And um, it was that training that really got me to where I was. Plus, the school had a great placement program. And um, three weeks, I was out of school about, I don't know, about six months, and I was doing little jobs in Redondo. I lived in the South Bay in Redondo, Manhattan, and, mm. and, and Hermosa. And um, working at a little recording studio called We Studios, that, um, uh, where I met a very dear friend of ours named Ted Keflo. Mm. That's where I met him. Mm. And um, school called me and said, we've got a job for you at a real studio in, in Hollywood. So I went to this place called Unicorn Records and I got the job and the woman handed me a set of keys and said, you open up and you close up. So I was everything. I was the guy who opened up and I ran for food and I cleaned the bathrooms and I... The apprenticeship. That's it. And mm -hmm. I ran cables and I, you know, uh, and I was there three weeks. I worked on a couple of records with a guy named John Gass. Mm -hmm. And um, I came in one morning and this was back in the days of chief engineers when every studio, there were no independent guys. You worked for a particular studio. 
And I came in one morning and she said, the chief engineer just quit. You're now chief engineer and Black Flag will be here at one o'clock to do their new record. And I was suddenly, in three weeks, I was chief engineer Amazing. at this recording studio. Mm, what an opportunity. It was, it was, you know, throw me in the deep end of the pool and see if I can swim. Mm. And the, I still remember walking from her office to the studio, longest walk I've ever had in my life, and standing in front of the MCI console, which I had never worked. And I'm standing in front of this board, and the signal flow that Brian taught us was just crystallized in my mind. It was like, oh, wow, here it is. Everything hmm. that I need to know is all right here. Uh, and next thing I know, I'm in the middle of the session with the guys from Black Flag. Hmm. Did you know the band beforehand? I mean, were you no. obviously not, you've never been a punk. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't a punk. But one of the things that that uh, when I look back in retrospect is that I had to I had to give up my idea of working on the type of music that I liked. Yeah. And it was just whatever walks in the door is what is what you do. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I've done everything. I've had a I've had a number one jazz album, number one rock album, number one pop album, number one country record, a number one R and B record. So I've sure. done a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. But it was that that training in what's going on under the hood, so to speak. Sure. Not just being able to drive the car, but understanding what, what everything's going on underneath. So you can, uh, you know, I'm not a technician. Do you play any instruments? Uh, I play drums and keyboards. And okay. I actually have a degree in music. I have an associate's degree in, in music. Okay. So, okay, so you, you, um, you did your education in Michigan, mm -hmm. right. and then you did, you did music studies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I went to college in, in, in a little community college in Detroit. Do you read music? I can follow a chart. I mean, at one time I did. It's been a long time since I read music. But mm. I always, whenever I'm in a session, I always get a chart so that I can follow, can follow along on. and stay with the band, which is something that, that has served me well. The producers are always impressed when you take a chart. Mm. Even, I tell my students, even if you can't read the chart, take it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> looks good. So, do you do you think it's to have? Uh, oh, obviously, it's a massive advantage. But you don't have to have musical training to be a recording engineer, or do you think you do? I, I kind of think that some training, you know, being from Detroit, all of my analogies all have to do with cars. Yeah. So, to me, to be a recording engineer and not have an understanding of music would kind of be like designing tires without understanding how a car works. Mm. You kind of, that's the product you're working with generally. Film and television, it's a little bit more varied as to what you're recording, but you know, mostly what we're working with is music, is the mm. end product. So having a bit, an understanding of the product helps you to communicate with the musicians. If you don't know... The kind of technical aspects of it. Yeah. 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 If you don't know the terminology, yeah. you know, if they Especially want you to go to the bridge or something, yeah. you don't know what it is. If it's real professional musicians who do read and they bring mm -hmm. charts and stuff, you yeah. have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, this series of videos, obviously there's professional high-end people who watch them, but we also have a lot of uh, people wanting to get into the industry, mm -hmm. and they want to know what to do, and I get asked all the time, you know, should I do an electronics degree, should I do one of these audio engineering courses, mm -hmm. and so I think what you're saying as well, it'd be cool to say, okay, you need some basis in understanding the, the mechanics or the... The, the, you know, the basis of music and how it's uh, yeah. structure. Yeah, and, and a little technical as well. I yeah. mean, I have no formal technical training. Yeah, but you're pretty you good, know. You, yeah. you understand yeah. quite mm -hmm. good electronics, I know that, and yeah. acoustics. Yep, because um, I was, uh, in college I was really interested in electronic music, mm. but as a, as a new form of music, not a synth replacing a piano or something like that, but mm. electronic music. And Craft work. Yeah. That kind of thing, exactly, yeah. or, or Tangerine Dream, mm. or things like that. Nice. And, um, you know, the synths that I worked with were test equipment that was all patched together, so mm. you kind of had to have a little knowledge of that. Mm. But, of course, my instructors at, at school had no idea what electronic music was all about, so yeah. they looked at me as this kind of strange guy. But I went into jazz band one day with my synth, and the uh, instructor said, we're not doing film score. And I said, no, give me uh, something you don't have covered. Give me a fourth trumpet part or a, something like that. And I used to fill in on whatever t part he had missing in his arrangement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he well, we'll, we'll cool. come to it later, but uh, when I was listening to interviews with, with Quincy Jones, who you know quite well and worked with a lot, it's kind of the, uh, you know, the textures of music. And, and he can know, I oh, know that needs a little bit of essence mm -hmm. of trumpet or what yeah know, it's like a recipe mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely it's masters it. of that yeah it's like it is like cooking it's like you know a little a little pinch of salt you see some guy take this little pinch of salt and throw it in and you go 
how could that little thing make a difference? But that, it does. That, yeah, it absolutely does. Hook, you know? yeah. 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 So back to the Black Flag. So that was uh, Henry Rollins had just started with that it. was, it was his Greg first Ginn record. and Raymond. I uh, no, it was Greg Ginn, Des Kadena, um, and a, a guy named Robo who played drums. And I think Robo was. He was from some Eastern European country, Lithuania. Right. He didn't speak English. Yeah. And they, they got their message across with grunts and points and do this. Yeah. And, you know. uh, and at first I thought, oh, I don't want to do some stupid punk band. You know? mm. But they were very serious. These guys took their, their gig very, very seriously. They weren't just crazy partiers. Mm. You know? uh, um, they got in there. They got to work. It was, a, it was all business. Mm. Uh, and the guy like a who, legendary, legendary yeah, album. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, and the guy who produced it, a guy named Spot, was one of these guys that like um, Greg would hit a chord, <laughs> this huge distorted guitar thing, and he would go, hey, Greg, a third string's out of tune. And Greg would turn off the distortion, and sure enough, mm. that string was out of tune. And that was one of those uh, things. An in-tune punk band? Well, these guys, yeah, <laughs> you know, but he would hear that stuff. Yeah. And that was one of those things that really made me realize that it's all about the details. Sure. And the smaller the details, if you think, well, that's just one little tiny detail, but you add that and the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one, and then you have the yeah. overall picture. Kind of like a producer know? thing, too, you were getting involved with. Yeah. But did they get your advice on things, or you were, the, you were there to capture it? I was a new guy, and mm -hmm. I, I, I confessed a spot to the producer that, Dude, I've been here three weeks, and he kind of took me under his wing and kind of, you know, showed me the ropes of, 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 you know, engineering a band, which is kind of a different thing because you got five guys in there and you got five personalities and all these instruments and and this jigsaw puzzle and this balancing act. You know, you're spinning these plates, mm. and you know, and he was he was very patient and, and really really taught me you a scared? lot. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I did two things. I said, no one's going to know. Yeah, you know, and I'm, you know, that signal flow. That was sure. that. I went. You know what? This stuff all works the same way. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I'm going to do a bit of a name drop thing because it's funny parallel. The, the other day, luckily, uh, Jeff Emmerich came out to Sydney for some shows. Mm -hmm. He recorded most of the Beatles. Albums, oh yeah. And he said the same thing. He was kind of thrown in. They're going, "Well, you're going to record the Beatles yeah. this weekend." Yeah. Yeah, the biggest band in the world. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, and he went it and, yeah. and did it. Yeah. And then started, you know, actually close miking mm -hmm. things, which was allowed, not allowed, you know. But yeah. So yeah, you jump in. I think that's that's the, the whole thing. You gotta go, this is my opportunity. Mm. You know, and it was like I, I think if if it if it had happened to me now, if I was in the mind frame that I am now in that position, I would have gone, no. <laughs> but I was yeah. young and dumb. <laughs> so your, your advice is just, you know, obviously work as hard as you can, try and prepare as much as you can, but go for it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. It's you know, it, it's 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 luck. Sure. You know, but you gotta if if all you are is lucky, then you better hope you're. What's all those things lucky. about luck, though? You know, opportunity meets yeah. preparation and all that. But yeah, yeah, I mean, luck comes every yeah. day. Yeah, and you if, grab it or don't you? Yeah. yeah, and if you you have to sort of make some of it too. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you if you graduate from school and you go home and you sit next to the phone and you go, I'm that first phone call. It's never going to come. Of course not. You got to get out there. You gotta, and it's getting tougher and tougher, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I, I, that's one of those things that I go back and forth on because it's tougher, but I don't think it's it's tough, but I don't think it's tougher because okay. when I graduated, there were only so many studios. Mm. It's today, you know, I, I mean, everybody's got a home studio, yeah, and there are all these guys who have them but don't really want to work them, so they they want somebody to come in there and do the nuts and bolts work. Yeah, right. So there's a lot of opportunity. It's just not. It's not laid out in front of you. Like, you know, when I graduated, you went to the recording studios because that's where the gigs were. Mm. Nowadays, you got to kind of find them. But how do you stand out today? If how do you, a young person wanting to get in to become an engineer, how, how do you stand out? How do you, how do you get noticed? Boy, uh, you know, it, just get out there and do it. You got to, you know, find some local band or, you know, and, and help them along and, and work for free and get out there and, you know, do everything that comes along. Don't, don't turn anything down. Mm. You know, but that's I, I think that's sort of a universal thing. I don't think anything has really changed. I think there are people who, who because this is the way they did it, the, the traditional way of doing things, and now it's not that way anymore, and they go, oh, it's really tough. I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I yeah. really don't. I think you, you have to make the opportunity. You know? yeah. One of the things I've noticed, and, and, but again, I'm interested to hear your, uh, whether it's true here or whether you feel it, bands don't seem to play live anymore. But whereas it used to be that was pretty well all there was because you couldn't mm -hmm. afford to do studio time. Yeah. So when they come in the studio, a lot of bands, they, you know, they know how to do the other process, but put them all together, 
and they mm. can't play yeah. that well live, even in the studio if they have to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Well, unfortunately, because I understand the process and everything, mm. I go out and I go and see a lot of bands, okay? Uh, and there's very few that can really play. Right. <laughs> you know, we have all these tricks and things that we can do in the studio sure. and I can, you know, I can I can put things where they need to be and, and, and make somebody do something they really can't mm. do. The digital um, razor blade and the auto tune yeah. and the all everything mm. else is there. Digital razor blade, a great name for a product. <laughs> <laughs> The next great thing, you yeah. know, that's like my product is what I could like to call autotude mm. <laughs> for when you have no, no performance. It's right, like you've okay. got this little thing that gives you the performance. Yeah. But um, getting out on the road and playing live is, is more, almost more important today because people did recordings to get you to come out and see them play live, mm. you know. Uh, recordings were never, like most artists in the, back in the old days, they didn't make their money off the records. That's why the record business was always structured the way it was because, you know, like Sinatra didn't make a ton of money selling records. He made a ton of money doing concerts mm. and he would make the record and then he would go out on tour and that was kind of their, their, their way of making money. A lot of bands come here to LA and they go, oh man, there's no place to play here in LA. Well, yeah, because this is Los Angeles. You, you could play maybe one or two dates a month and then you're finished. Mm. You gotta go somewhere. There's this great area between LA and New York called America. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. where you gotta go A lot play. of country towns. That's where you gotta gig go. Gig after yeah. gig. Yeah. yeah. That's hard work, mate. You don't wanna do that. Well, you know, it's all hard work. <laughs> no, no short plug -in. There's no plug-in for that. That's it. Yeah. So Glenn yeah. Bauer, tell me, mm -hmm. tell me about your association with Glenn. Um, well, Glenn, Glenn and I started working together. Um, I went from Unicorn Records. I was there about a year. And then, again, through my association with school, they sent me over to MCA Music Publishing. Mm. They were the first major publishing company with their own recording studio. And Lee Levy, who was the president of the company, when I went in there, he said, look, we don't do demos. We do masters. There, we don't even use the word demo around here. Mm. Uh, and he wanted the product that we put out, that if somebody liked it, all they would do is buy our master and put their artist over the top of the master. So mm. he wanted this quality. And um, so part of my interview, he had me go down in the studio and cut a track with one of their writers. And the writer that I wound up in there was, was, was Glenn Ballard. Mm. And we were there together for 10 years at MCA, wow. from 1981 to 1991. And all the, all the great writers filtered through MCA. It was one of the biggest published companies sure. in the world. And Leeds was very open to our writers writing with other people from other companies. And he said, you know, I'd rather have you know, 10,000 songs that are co-writes than 500 that are our own, mm. you know what I mean? So he was very open to making it happen. So um, in that 10 years from 81 to 91 was this transition from the traditional producer being the guy with the cigar and the phone making the deal going, yeah, that sounds great, mm. to the songwriter being the producer. And I was working with all the songwriters. Sure. Uh, so Glenn and I, we, we worked together for, I don't know, 14, 15 years. Nice. And I would say in that time, I probably spent more time with him than I did with my family. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's the business. Sure, that's I the understand. business, you know. Uh, and um, we did tons of stuff. We did all kinds of R&B. We did uh, the Evelyn King, Teddy Pendergrass, the Pointer Sisters. Mm. And then he got signed to Quincy Jones Publishing, which is how our connection to Quincy came Did you along. bring your Grammy? Yeah. Oh, I should have. Where is it? Gun it? I usually carry it with me, but it's so big. Not a keychain. <laughs> or a gold chain hanging around my neck. That'd be great. That was really amazing. So that was for yeah. um, Q, the Duke joint. Q's yeah. Duke joint. Yeah. yeah. Man, we did so many different projects together. And it was really fascinating to, to be in that kind of a situation because it wasn't the traditional thing where the engineer shows up at the studio and the band comes and they record the music. I was working with the songwriters mm -hmm. and I was watching the progress of, I've got this idea of this little melody and have it to the end product where we do the final mix. So I saw it from all stages. That's from big budget stuff end. though, isn't it? I yeah, mean, yeah, you know. You have to be uh, in that league to get that opportunity. It was so much luck of being in the right place at the right yeah. time. I mean, I was in the room with him and Saida Garrett when they wrote Man in the Mirror for Michael Jackson. And it was amazing because Glenn had that little dee da do 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 line that starts mm. off. Yeah. And he had, had a little chords and they, they were, knew they were writing for Michael. They came in and said, Michael's got a new album coming out. Mm. We're gonna, it's a follow-up to Thriller. 
So they were talking about, oh, Michael likes these big themes, you know, these big universal kind of themes. So what do we write about? And they were talking about, oh, this and that, and how about uh, change, we change the world? How, you know, and they, they did all these convolutions of how do you change the world? Well, you start with yourself, and you, you, you know, look at yourself, and you, you know, take stock of what you're doing. And how about, you know, one of those, like, looking in the mirror kind of things? Mm -hmm. And when, when Saeed Aguirre came up with the title, Man in the Mirror, it was almost like dictation. She wrote those. It's all about the idea, isn't it? It, it really is. And I've always felt, especially in my associate with songwriters, that great songs are already written mm -hmm. and you are simply the conduit to the, to the page. And that was one of those situations. I mean, I have the original demo of Man in the Mirror and it is so close to the final product that this, it was fully realized when it was born. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So it was, it was an amazing place to be because I learned that most basic thing is it all starts with the song. Yeah. You haven't got a song, you haven't got anything. Sure. You know. But working with Quincy, I mean, musical genius. And I mean, I haven't met him. You're supposed to hook me up, by the way. What happened with that? But you got me on camera saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get you. Um, yeah, so, you know, mm -hmm. I've seen lots of interviews, and, you know, and you've told me so many nice things about him as well, really mm -hmm. humble, but unbelievably clever. So you could just, mm -hmm. I'm sure it'd be amazing just to sit there and, and feed off all that and watch the process, yeah. as you were just saying. But any other any anecdotes from that from that uh, the Duke joint? Well, I, I mean, it's a seven and a half months anecdote. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the amazing thing with Quincy is that people say it must be amazing to watch him work. Mm. And in reality, and I, I I I want this to come off the right way. It's not what he does. It's what he brings to the party and what other people bring because they're coming in to work with Quincy. You know the old saying, the tide raises all ships. Sure, sure. People come in with, and they're in the studio with him and the A game just comes out because you're in there with the A guy. You yeah. know, uh, the adrenaline starts to flow. Yeah, and he, he lets you, like the thing with me, I was, I was overly intimidated when I first started. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, Jolie Levine, who was the production coordinator, who's, I've known her for years, she's done most of the records that I've worked on, uh, it was kind of funny, she called me up, uh, Bruce Houdin is, is Quincy's normal engineer, and mm. Bruce was in the middle of doing the album History with Michael. Mm. And she called me up and she said, um, um, I got a project with Quincy Jones, would you be interested? Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry, I, I got to get my hair cut. You sure. know. <laughs> and, and, you, and you do, by the way. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so she got me in on this project and it was supposed to be a live album and it was going to be four days. My, my gig was for four days to cut I was going to cut all the tracks with Quincy. We were going to go to Capitol and cut the stuff. So I walk in the first day, and there's all these machines, all these crazy tape machines. Well, what Quincy wanted to do was take all these old recordings, peel off the band, and recut the band. The first thing he put up was, it was Sinatra, and it was either Fly Me to the Moon or something like that, but it was a three track. Okay, and the music was on two and Frank was on one. Mm. The problem is Frank's in the room with the band. Yeah, right. So we couldn't peel it off. But I mean, I'm looking at all these tapes. I'm going, oh my God, look at this stuff. They you sound know. amazing, don't they? It was, I was just telling you, I went down to uh, Carla to see, uh, mm -hmm. stay with Bruce and, uh, and he played, I think it was some Count Basie. And you li other than tape hiss, mm -hmm. the sound quality, just yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. Well, part of that is very little technology getting in the way. Yeah, great mic placement, great musicians. Mic pre, yeah. tape recorder, yeah. bada bing, bada bang, you're done. Yeah. Now we've got, we have, there's a great line in a Billy Joel song where he says, all your choices make you change your mind. Mm. Well, we've got all the choices you could imagine. Mm. You know, so it's like we always gotta go, ooh, how about if I did this? By the time you're done, you've run through 800 things and it's gone. Absolutely, it's like, yeah. uh, Mike, remember that gig we did years ago at uh, the studio in Carp and Vinnie was playing drums and yeah. he, he tuned it up, he set it up and there was all these mics on it. I remember you, you said, come here. And you had, uh, there was tons of mics on it, but I think you had the kick and two overheads. Yeah, overheads. And then we were, everyone's going, man, what a sound. So yeah. where are you putting that snare? Where are you doing? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, free it's, mics. Well, also, you know, when you're talking about that older stuff, those are great musicians, yeah. you know? And it's like, you know, I, I always at the end of sessions when guys say to me, man, you know, stuff sounded great, you did a great job. My comment is always, I couldn't have done it without you. Play with the best, you look good. That's it, man, yeah. you know? Because those guys come in, they, they got great gear, they play them really well. My job's easy. 
Yeah, that's you why know. you're here. So that's you're right. Me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm going to take credit for it all. Of there course. you go. There you go. So mm -hmm. you also worked with uh, Alanis Morissette on that, mm -hmm. you know, the jagged little pill. Yeah. What What were yeah. you doing on that album? So I was the engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the last records that Glenn and I did together. Uh, it was an amazing thing because it was so uh, not planned. Mm. Okay. She had been. Um, she was the. I always loved this. She was the Paula Abdul of Canada. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Which was. Lovely monitor. Yeah, she could dance? No, she, well, they had this whole thing. They had it all, you know, the dancers, the music, the whole, th they just didn't have the person. Mm. And somehow they found her and plugged her in. And so she was with MCA Canada and they brought her down to write. And she had been with all the other writers all around town. And a couple of days before she was supposed to leave, uh, Rick Shoemaker, who was the vice president, called Glenn and said, well, would you work with this girl? And he said, yeah. So she came over, and I, th I might be mistaken, but I think they wrote Ironic and You Ought to Know that first day. Okay, and Glenn said to she me... She wrote it there? I always thought yeah. the whole thing was done... No, it was all done... It's an amazing album. It was all done uh, at MCA Music at Glenn's studio, and then they did a few things yeah. around town. Um, and we cut, I think, 11 songs with her. Okay, and I mean songwriting demos. I mean done, boom, over and done with. I mean they, sure. it was it was kind of to a certain degree the album I never thought Glenn would make because he was so uh, a perfectionist. Mm. This was like wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, sent it off. And it was over and done with. Mm. Uh, and then they finished those eleven songs, and he went out to shop, and I got the gig with Quincy, mm -hmm. and which was uh, only supposed to be four days turned into seven and a half months yeah, right. you know and in the meantime they continued to write so the only the only song that that survived of the group that i did was a song called perfect you've got to measure up make me prouder. i love being part of it because it was such a study in what's right and what's wrong with the music business. Right. I mean, she way. got turned down by everybody. Yeah, it's crazy. Everybody. Mm. You know, overly sensitive, whiny chick singers, nobody's buying that. Mm. 30 million records later. Mm. Because they just put it out. No no blitz, no giant ad campaign, send it to a couple of college radio stations, and it just caught on to the point where stations, big AAA stations, we don't play that kind of stuff. They had to play it. Yeah. You know? So it was what was right about the business because it was such an honest record. I mean, there was no, it wasn't like, oh, well, we better go back in and rethink this vocal line or what. It was like, of the moment, feel, bam, this is it, done. Is that opportunity still around? Yeah. It is. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think every opportunity is still around. So. I think people put obstacles in the way. Mm. You know, oh, you can, we don't, that's not how it's done anymore. So again, because lots of, you know, I've obviously got lots of young muso mm -hmm. friends and kids asking questions and stuff, and I'll think, oh, you can't, it's not like that anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. Eh, yeah. You know, it is. It's, it's people who, who have a closed mind, you yeah. know. I mean, my, this, the time I spent with Quincy, I, I, can't, uh, I, I can't attribute enough of my outlook to that time. One of the things, he's got some great sayings, and one of the things he said to me was, don't nobody know nothing. And that's like, that's reverberated with me so much. Nobody really knows anything. It's all a guess. He's an know? honest, yeah, yeah. Honest, generous guy. Yeah, you know? And you find the, the, the most uh, intelligent or, or artistic people, they're confident in themselves. Yes. Yeah. And they're also nervous and creating new mm -hmm. things and they're yeah, unsure. It's yeah. great. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a, of a nothing to prove yeah. thing. He's already Absolutely. proved the real, it. The real deal. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I always tell my students, the only problem with working with great musicians is you don't get to spend much time with them. <laughs> yeah. Because they come in and do the gig and they're gone. Yeah, right. You know? But uh, um, uh, the Alanis thing was, was absolutely amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, she was just kind of this shy little girl and um, this monstrous thing mm. came out of it. Which is great. You know? Yeah. You yeah. did some stuff with B.B. King around that time as well from yeah. memory. I remember seeing some photos. We were working on a television show and he oh. came in and sort of played B.B. King yeah, on the yeah. show. And uh, my favorite memory from that was his guy came in early to get set up. Yeah. Okay, so he, first thing I've got a little chair, not not like this, but a soft chair. And he said, "Now, BB King likes just a regular folding chair." So, okay, so we get it all set up, and he gets a case, and he opens a case, and he tunes a guitar, and he sets a guitar down. And I'm in the room doing stuff, and I turn to walk out of the room, and it dawned on me, and I stop, and I turn around. That's Lucille. It's Lucille. <laughs> <laughs> That's not just a guitar, man. It was like. Wow, you know, he was 
the nicest guy in the world. You know the best part of that for me? was the massive road mic that you sat next to that, when you sent me that photo. That was it, that was it, man. Yeah, I think you know? MTV it was at the time. Yep, yeah. I think that was about the time that I started using the road mic. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and just, to, just to give you a quick little plug, okay? Thanks, the man. thing with road microphones, because I've had people say this to me before, oh, you say nice things about the product because you're an endorsee. Well, I'm not a road endorsee, right? I've been, been using your products for a long time because they're great microphones. And the thing I like best about road microphones is when you put it up in front of the instrument and you walk back in the control room and you bring up the fader, it's that instrument. There's no color to them. I always kid my students about they won't help you out. If you got an ugly sounding drum set, you're going to get a lovely recording of an ugly sounding drum set. But I couldn't ask anymore from a microphone to just capture it the give way me it is. what it That's is. That's what we try. You know, yeah. Thanks, yeah. mate. I appreciate that. This advert brought to you yeah, that's by. Right. That's right. <laughs> hey, also, mm -hmm. you know, um, you told me um, you used the event 2020s mm -hmm. on uh, with that the Duke joint. Yeah, pieces. I think I had the very first pair because they brought them over to me. I was at a place called uh, Skip Sailor, right. and we was, I was doing a remix for one of the one of the tracks, and we brought them over. I had a pair of. Genelec 1031As. That's okay. <laughs> good monitors. Uh, I, I, you know, and I, I loved you them. Hear that over the. <laughs> <laughs> I liked them. I yeah, bought sure. them. You know, they were very expensive monitors, and they brought them in and set them next to my, to my 1031s, mm. and I was floored at how great they sounded, and I started using them, and when I finished that mix, we took it over to to Bernie Grumman's for mastering. The album was finished, but we remixed this one song. We were going to insert it in the middle of it. And I'm in the in the uh, mastering lab with Bernie, which is one, one of the finest mastering facilities yeah. and one of the best mastering engineers in the world. And he takes the, the, the master with all the songs on it, and he takes the one that we just did, and he pulls it out, and he takes the new one that I just finished and puts it in, and gets ready to do the mastering, and he's sitting in front of his console, and he's turning knobs, and he turn it and turn it off, turn one, turn it off, and he goes, I don't need to do anything to now this that's mix. That's cool. And I was like, I'm going to use floored. that in our new ad campaign it was, for the new ones. It, it really was. It was like it was an really? amazing thing. Did to, you mix the whole album on it? I mixed some of it, but mm. most of it was done by Bruce. Okay. You know, another one of those things where I was terrified because I'd been working on this for seven months and I'm about to turn my cake over to one of the greatest you know sure. chefs in the world for him to put the frosting on it. Mm. You know, and it's like the best compliment I ever got was from Bruce when he said that was the easiest mix I ever did because everything was as it should be, where it should be. Do you have any, any sort of thoughts or advice with monitoring, set up, you know? Um, well, the best advice that I can give with monitoring is that you have to have some kind of a reference disc. Yeah. Because even if, you're, even if you take your monitors with you, you're in a different room. Yeah, of course. They're in a different space. They're in, they're, you know. So if you have a disc that you know really, really well, mm -hmm. you, I can, I've got two. I use Quincy Jones' Back in the Block and I used the soundtrack to the Disney movie Aladdin, uh, which was done by Bruce Botnick, who's an amazing mm. engineer, did all the Doors stuff, great, great engineer. And those, I can walk into a studio and throw one of those discs in, and in a couple of minutes I can tell you what's going on with the room. Th I know those records so well mm. that I can say, ooh, this room's got a bottom end problem. Mm. And if I make my recording sound like it should sound in the room, I'm going to take it out of there and we have trouble with the bottom end. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, that's my thing is the monitors will, will give you what you need, but you've got to remember the room is 50% of the sound. You know, yeah. Take yeah. a great set of monitors into a bad room, mm. you're going to get bad sound. Aerosmith, yes. tell me what you did with them. Um, I worked with them down in Florida on an album called Nine Lives. It was a real interesting experience because that was really one of the first uh, major rock bands that I had ever worked with. And when I say major, I mean a band that has been together as long as they have. Sure. And they have their set way of working in the studio. Um, that was also with Glenn. And his forte was new artists. Mm -hmm. So most of the stuff that we did, we were in a studio with a new artist who might have been the first time they were in a studio. You know, so we, didn't, we were able to set the tone and to, to set the pace and everything. Whereas these guys had been doing it a long time and then they had their way of doing it. And we did it down at um, Criteria in Florida. Mm. And I remember walking in to the studio. They had already been there for about a month writing, 
and I came down and get ready to do the session. And I walked in and it was like the guitar section at the NAMM show. I mean, there were, I think there, I think I counted a hundred guitars on stands. Wow. And every combination of head and cabinet in the world. And when they would get ready to do a guitar part, uh, um, they would go out to the studio with their guitar tech and they would audition thousands of combinations, mm. you know. Um, so it took a... Is that it, valid? That sounds out of the top. Well, it is because it's them. Any other any other band, it would be, hey, look, this studio time, and it's yeah. like, you know... But, but they, it, was it any better than just coming in there with a cool guitar, a good amp, and cranking it out? Um, you know? Hard to say. Yeah. Hard to say, but once Joe got what he wanted, you know, the guitar part was there, and it yeah, was the it gear, was their thing. Yeah, different flavors yeah. and stuff. Yeah, you know uh, that it was it was kind of crazy because it was Aerosmith, so it was very high profile. So we had MTV showing up, and we had Rolling wow. Stone showing up, and we had all these people coming in. Plus the distraction of being somewhere other than home. Mm. You know, I'm not real big on going to a so-called exotic locale. Not that Miami's an exotic locale, but mm. where you're in the studio all day working and then you go home and you sleep in some strange bed, mm. you know? Uh, but I, I mean, I, I enjoyed being down there. It was very cool. We, we stayed in South Beach, which was really nice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you go out in the morning and walk on the beach. And we did um, about four months down there working on, on Nine Lives. And then for some reason, they went back to Boston and recut the whole record. Mm. But you know, I mean, that's the way records get done. There's no, sure. there's the old saying, most records aren't finished, they're simply abandoned. But it was a good yeah. experience. It was, it was great. I really enjoyed working with the guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Steven is every bit the rock star, you know, and they were easy to work with. There was no, Perfection. there were no attitudes, you know. Yeah. Um, he would show up at the studio. I remember one time he bought this, like, lounge chair that was one of those kind of massage chairs, and I come in the studio and I go, what is this massage chair? Oh, I saw it in the store. I thought it was cool. Bought it. You know, mm. they went and they hunted. They went on some kind of a hunt for wild boars. And I came in the studio and here's the two heads mounted and hanging on the wall. Wow. It was like, wow, man, this is real like, rock star stuff. Yeah, this is real rock star stuff. This is like the only get when you're at this level of yeah, right, right. <laughs> of the recording. It'd business. be fun to try it for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about gear. So, what? How yeah. are you recording now? I don't, I don't view the process any differently than I ever did. Right. The only difference is the machines are smaller, uh, they're less expensive, and they'll do whatever it is I want them to do. Because mm. I remember back in the day going, wow, you know it would be really cool if we could, but how would you do that? There's no way to do it. Yeah. You know, Like for instance, the drummer's playing along and there's one beat where he and the bass player aren't quite together. And you go, wow, you know it would be really cool if we could just, but you can't because you're on a linear piece of tape and you can't. Well, nowadays I can do that, mm. okay? But I don't, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a gear snob, okay? Um, I tell my students when they, I've had them ask me, what's the best mic to use on a vocal? Which is such an oblique question. Mm. And I tell them, sometimes it's the microphone you happen to have in your hand. Mm. Because you've got to do the gig and you can't, you can't make excuses for your equipment, you know. Uh, you don't see a disclaimer on the album that says, please forgive the way this record sounds, I only had a $3 budget. Mm. You know, uh, they're gonna they're gonna put your album up against everybody else and go, wow, that album sounded terrible. You mm. know, so I approach every session as if it's a master. There's no that was from my training in MCA. There's no demos. Everything this could be on the radio. Yeah, you know, so everything is is, is approached the same way. I try to use as little gear as possible so that my signal path is clean as it can be. So that once it's recorded then I can do whatever I want to it later. If, you know, I've been in a lot of situations where you're getting up a drum sound and it's a little distorted because you're, you know, you're, you're getting levels and your drummer's playing quietly and then you say, hey man, can you, you know, give it to me at record level and all of a sudden and it's all distorted and the producer goes, I love that, let's record it just like that. Mm. You know? I teach my students the main job of a recording engineer is to keep the producer from getting into trouble. Okay? That kind of a situation, let's record it all distorted. No, let's record it nice and clean. Hmm. And then we distort it so that after you've done 18 guitar overdubs, suddenly the distorted drums don't sound so good anymore. Well, if I distort it post-recording. So everything that I do, I do after I've recorded it. Hmm. But you use really good equipment, these high-end stuff. Um, well, my disclaimer is I record using the finest equipment at hand. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes you're not in the, in the 
case in the place where you have all the best gear. But absolutely. Is there I, massive differences, you think, in, in, in digital recording? I mean, because obviously there is no analog anymore. Well, this is, a, this is an interesting area because I'm not a, like I said, I'm not a gear snob. Mm. You know, to me, I don't care what I'm using. What I care is what's coming out of the speaker. Okay. okay, and if I if I'm liking what's coming out of the speaker, and when digital first came along, it sounded horrible because they did the old brick wall filters, where mm -hmm. you know they said theoretically we hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, so that's where we're, we're going to lop it off. Yeah. You know, it's like well that's not true. That's you know, these other harmonics. Going yes, on yes. So once once digital really got to the point where it, where they got rid of the the filters and everything was starting to sound better, to me. I jumped on digital right away because what I was getting was kind of the same thing I said about the microphones. Yeah. It was a perfect reproduction of what I was hearing. Okay? And people talk about the warmth of analog. Analog does a fundamental change to your sound. Every time you play it, you scrape some of those oxides off. Every time you put the tape up, it sounds different. Mm. And I don't know about other engineers, but I don't want my stuff to sound different. Mm. I want it to sound exactly the way I recorded it. Yeah. So I, you know, I use everything that comes along. I, I use from the, from the lowest price to the highest price, and if it gives me what I want, then I'm all over it. The last thing I look at is the price tag. Yeah, and know? it's a really, it's an amazing era now where, you know, we were talking about it before, how easy it is, how low cost it is to buy incredible equipment. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. open to anybody now. Mm -hmm. but then again, it comes down to techniques. Yeah. And then the other thing we were talking about, of course, is the room. Yeah, and you then you spoke about your monitoring, mm -hmm. but the same applies to studios. And um, of course, you know these massive studios. There are how many are left in the world? Yeah, and nobody could afford it. We talked about capital, and mm -hmm. what would we work that out? Thirty, forty million dollars to build it? You'd never do it unless yeah. you're a billionaire and insane. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we call Paul Allen and say, there you go. "Great yeah. idea." <laughs> and uh, reverb rooms and those chambers downstairs, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, but it's gone. Yeah. Well, it used to be, at least from, from my fuzzy math, mm. that in the, back in the old days, the room really was the cheapest part because, you know, $100,000, $200,000 and buy, you could build a beautiful room for that kind of money. Mm. Then you bring in your $80,000 tape machine and your half million dollar board. And, you know, none of that stuff includes the wires you or the installation. Yeah. I mean, so now the room is the most expensive part yeah. because the gear, you know, you could you put together an amazing setup for two grand, yeah. you know. But if you take that amazing thing into a crummy room, you know, I did a, a, a series of a, a video on designing your home studio and what really brought that to mind, what, what really spurred me to do that was somebody came to me and said, I'm looking for a new set of speakers because I'm not getting out of my speakers what I want. Mm. And I said, well, what kind of speakers do you have? And he said, well, I got those Event 2020s. And I said, I don't think it's your speakers, man. It's probably your room. So I went over to his place and sure enough, I mean, it was all out of balance. The speakers were in the wrong place. He hadn't done anything to the room. That treatment. And it's like, well, you, you can't. You, you, first thing you have to do is do the room because if the room isn't right, nothing else is right. And sure. that's, the, that's the big overlooked thing. You go to the music store, man, well, they sell you gear, boy. They'll, go, they'll, they'll hook you up. They'll get you everything you need. But they don't ever say, where are you going to put this? Mm. You know, yeah, it's, it's very overlooked. So what do you think is the future of the industry, the recording industry? What's, what's, what's um, coming up? I think I think it's really bright because it was very very controlled back in the day. You know, it was so expensive to record that you mm. had to have the backing of a record company in order to do it. The the distribution network was totally locked up. You know, you couldn't get your record out there. Now you have so many avenues for your record that there's so much stuff out there. You know, the cream always rises to the top. You know, mm. there will always be the best stuff will always find its way out. But sometimes what's the, what was great the record company would go well we're probably not going to sell that many records of this sort of stuff you know i have four kids and they all listen to completely different music and my oldest daughter always brings home this really interesting stuff that you know you you're not going to hear it on any radio station but it's always really really interesting and mm. it's like this is somebody's art and who's to say that the only difference really kind of sort of is that michelangelo that was you know, hundreds of years ago, and mm. you're not going to make another one. So, you know, everybody's art is unique. So to me, it's, there's so much more venue out there. There's a lot more crap out there, mm. badly recorded stuff, and I, I, 
I'd like to see that improve. But at the same time, I look back at the Alanis Morissette record, which got every accolade it could get except for Best Engineered. Yeah. Because that was so thrown together. Yeah. You know, because it wasn't, it wasn't going to be a record. These were songwriting demos, mm. you know. And um, that's me. I, I listen to everything that I did and go, oh, wow, I could have done this better. And, I, and I'm sure everybody does that. I'm sure if you were to ask Paul McCartney, he would want to go back in and recut the vocal on yesterday. So, yeah. you know, everybody thinks that they always could have done a better job. You know? But, I, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather listen to a bad recording of a great song than a great recording of a bad one. Yeah. And there were... There were a lot of bad songs out there that record companies put out and touted, and somehow they found themselves under the charts. But the future's bright, and the it's future's exciting. very bright. It's very exciting. I, um, you know, I go to the trade shows every year, and I see all this great new stuff coming along, and and people's creativity because now, you know, we're in the era of can't say no. Mm. You know, can you do this? Absolutely. Can you do that? Oh, I can do stuff that. You know, that back in the day was, you know, we used to have this um, uh, cartoon that hung on the wall at Universal, and it was a guy getting on the space shuttle. But as he's getting on the space shuttle, he's got his punch card, and he's punching in. And the caption was, what was once science fiction is now part of our job description. Mm. And that's really where it is. We're, you know, I mean, I, I'm working on this TV show right now, and I go, I'm running all the music, and I walk in with a laptop and a hard drive. Mm. Whereas two years ago, I had a rack of stuff that I had so I could plug all this stuff in. Yeah. Now it's, it's this little thing and it sounds easily as good. It does everything I want it to do. So convenience will always trump sound quality. You know, look at MP3s for crying out loud. Mm. You know, I mean, sure. they sound terrible, but that doesn't stop anybody. You mm. know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I always like to, to make the joke about, you know, if, if there's, you have four friends over for dinner, you're going to break out a really nice bottle of wine. But you've got 10,000 people coming, everybody gets water, you know? I mean, because you've got to water it down in order for everybody to like it. Sure. Lots of good sayings, lots of great anecdotes. I like mm -hmm. the one I'll leave us with today is that cream always rises to the top. Mm -hmm. Francis? And don't drive past the money. I like it. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks.